Welcome to the Venezuelan Diaspora Project, where you will find Venezuelan entrepreneurs and change makers that we searched and interviewed to present to you. My name is Jesus Bolivar, also known as Chubeto. So let's get to it. And welcome to this session on the Venezuelan diaspora. My name is Jesus Bolivar. Thank you so much for joining us today. When we have uh, Victor Cárdenas, a Venezuelan entrepreneur who's 19 years old. He's a computer scientist student from Stanford, and he's working on a startup and supporting this project on getting to know the Venezuelan diaspora. Welcome, Victor. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for, for having me. Uh, it's great to have you, man. So it, it looks like how long ago did we meet each other? Like three, four years ago? I think we met probably like two years ago. Two years ago when I was applying to, to college, you were my, my MIT interviewer. That's right. um, and I remember we, we talked on the phone. You were in the Bay and I was I was all the way back in, in Venezuela. In I would have never thought that after having that telephone conversation, we would be uh, having this conversation today. I feel extremely lucky and proud to have you. So, so yeah. let's get to it. So um, we're going to divide this in three in three parts. One, let's talk about your entrepreneurial journey, you know, what, and, you know, tell us what you're up to and how it came about and all those things. Then we're going to talk about what happened before the venture, like your life before you had this crazy idea of starting a company. And then some advice that you have for uh, entrepreneurs or folks that are thinking about being entrepreneurs. And then lastly, this is a, a, a space about Venezuelans and uh, that are not in Venezuela. So we'll, we'll talk about your experiences of Venezuela. So let's, let's get started. Tell, tell us about, you know, how the idea came about and, and what you're working on now. Right, sure. So right now I'm working um, on this this project, um, in this app called TopTop, an app that helps people split uh, the cost of, of subscriptions. And and the idea sort of came out of, out of desperation in that I had uh, split uh, the cost of subscriptions with people in the past. And that uh, required me to actively go out and remind people to, to pay me back um, at the end of every month. And, and it tended to be pretty unsustainable. And I knew that there sort of had to be a better way. There, there currently was no way to automatically uh, sort of bill my friends on a recurring basis. And so that uh, coupled with the fact that what used to be, say, one Netflix subscription or, or cable is now um, a variety of, of streaming services mean that, that there's probably a lot of people like me that have the same sort of issue. And so I said, all right, I'll solve this problem for myself, but I'll also sort of distribute it and see if I can, you know, make some money, help make people's better uh, lives better uh, through this, you know, project. Got it. Got it. So that, that's, there's a lot to unpack here. So you're working on an app. Mm -hmm. It's an app to uh, split sort of the tab, split a, a, a bill that you have from specifically your subscription accounts, mm -hmm. right? So or, or, or recurring costs like like rent or, or utilities. Essentially, um, the the idea is that um, it's very it's very easy now with existing tools like Venmo and Cash Shop mm -hmm. to split one off expenses, um, or or even with Splitwise to split a, a variety of expenses with people you share a lot of expenses with. But it's very difficult uh, to split a recurring costs because that requires the the receiving party to consistently ask a, the paying party a Oh, like it's time to pay up. It's time to pay up at the end of every month. Yeah. Um, and, enter a whole trust relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And we all know that it sucks to be asking your friends for money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like that ruins fun. relationships. It's not, it's not the greatest. Got it. So this is like the, the again, the sort of the, your stere the stereotypical, you saw a problem that you were facing and you decided, Hmm, I could solve this for myself and help and offer it to other people. Right. Yeah. So, um, and are you doing this by yourself? Like, how did how did you find other folks to work with? Like, tell us about that that experience, how how it came together, right? Because I think you guys have been doing this since the pandemic started, right, or before? Like, I think a, a little bit after the pandemic started. Essentially, when uh, COVID hit, uh, I was stuck at home with 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 a couple of friends. Uh, so I go I go to Stanford right now. I'm a sophomore. I forgot to mention that at the beginning. Oh, cool. Yeah, like we said, all right, let's 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 start working on this. We started like playing around with with a no code editor, um, and it wasn't very effective. And so at, after that, like those two friends oh, dropped out. Hold on. Um, so you started with a no code approach. So basically, like a prototype that that was based on what? Uh, this no code uh, 
platform called called Bubble, got um, it, and we it. just wanted to like prove, try, like sort of prove the concept. But I don't know, it didn't give us all the flexibility that we wanted. And so those two but, friends eventually ended up dropping out, okay. and I a, like started building the the product in. Uh, as a web app I, and for like a couple months and kind of passively because I was doing an internship so like a research assistantship in as, as sort of like my main thing nice and so after that to get to, to sort of answer your question I said you know what I kind of like want to like do this a little more a bit more seriously and so oh coincidentally actually I, I talked to this friend of mine I met probably very uh, little time before I met you the summer program at MIT um, that I know is like super technical like he is can just execute write code super fast, super effectively. And I don't know, I just, you know, pitched him the idea. I was like, I really think we can mass distribute this, like make an impact, let's let's work on this together. And so you ha- did you have to convince him or he was just sold the minute he saw the prototype? So he, I think he wasn't sold at the beginning. I think when I showed him to him at first, he's like, oh, this kid, like he's probably not even that good a dev. Like, I don't know, I don't like this that much. But then I like sort of, approach them in a similar uh, sense that I, in how I would like approach a, an investor of some sorts. Like I, I made like a quasi pitch or something. And I was like, Hey, I think we, we have like complementary skill sets, like, and, and, and it's like an interesting problem, problem to, to be working on. Got it. Got it. So, okay. So you created a prototype, you learned from the prototype, the prototype sort of helped you get to that next stage of finding other partners and folks to basically join the project, right? That that's, that's pretty, that's an awesome insight. It's just, you just got to get started right on something and, and tell me how are things now? Like tra- any traction or like things that you've learned? Why are you still working on this? I'm sure you're seeing some positive signals. Right. So we're, we're launched um, on the app store. We have a waiting list. And um, so we, we're, we're still in, in, in private beta. We have a waiting list of approximately uh, 350 people. And we're actually like keeping the amount of people on the platform intentionally small at right. first. And just to make sure that we're really solving like people's problems um, and that we're not just like hypothetically like throwing something out there. And, and also in the interest of making sure we don't have like glaring bugs that'll get strangers to say like negative things about us. And um, before we sort of like really ironed out the like rough edges that we have. But, gotcha. but hopefully by the end of the year, we'll, we'll do a, a harder launch where we'll just like invite anyone that wants to come on to download the product well if you're listening and you want in uh we will will uh, push victor to send us some uh invites fingers crossed uh, remind me the name of the app so that i can search for yeah. it's tab tab so it's like a tab so it's like t-a-b t-a-b Got and it. so tab tab yeah, yeah. Okay. if you want if you want to you can be- i gotta ask it what that so this is like the typical thing that you know questions that you will get asked uh, from investors and folks that are interested in your company so uh tell me about your target audience and what you think is the size of the opportunity? If, you, if you've done the sort of the... the no, definitely. Yeah. So I think that there's a sort of two-folded... There is, it's, the audience is people like me, like cost-conscious uh, young people. Um, but I would say it's particularly people that are out of college. Mm-hmm. Just because when you are in college, you have a lot of like student discounts available to you. And so subscriptions tend to be more affordable mm-hmm. than when you're like a recent college grad, right? And so just obviously like any number I say is, is pretty arbitrary, but just to That's have like a rough idea out there, there's like 50 million 18 to 29 year olds um, in the US. Uh, during COVID, everyone's like particularly um, frugal. Um, stuck at home. Yeah, st- 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 stuck at home. I mean, but but frugal because, because I mean, people's disposable income has gone down because of like the ensuing recession. But I, I guess like an also, another interesting statistic is that around 75% of that demographic owns a, a subscription and around half has split the cost of one in the past. And so that's, that's I would say, like, sort of like our TAM. Even beyond that, I think that given a tool like ours, people would consume more subscription content than they regularly would and just because it's more like affordable um, for them. Gotcha, gotcha. By the way, TAM is total addressable market. So yeah, that, that is awesome. I really like that hypothesis that because you're able to facilitate the split, you're able to reduce the cost. And by reducing the cost, potentially you open up demand for those services, right? Because mm-hmm. instead of paying, I don't know, $5 for Netflix, paying five instead of 10, then I'm more likely to perhaps pay for HBO Max, right? Exactly. Um, and sort of expand, expand the number of subscriptions that I buy at the same level of income, of disposable income. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. That's the, that's the idea behind so, it. And, and speaking of, so tell me what hypotheses are you trying to test, right? Because you're saying 
you're keeping the user count low and you're going into this like testing phase. What are the hypotheses that you're trying to test, if any? I think you might. So one, I think the obvious one is will people use it, right? But right. So I, I'll give you I'll give you a couple things, uh, a couple examples of things that we're testing right now. The first is to see whether or not people appreciate um, the ability for us to find their subscriptions automatically. Mm -hmm. So the way that, that the product currently works is you link your bank account with something called Plaid, which is what Venmo, Robinhood, et cetera, use to like access your account. And then we automatically find your subscriptions. And the way, the way it works right now is uh, you select the subscription we find, invite uh, other people that you'd like to, to split it with. And then every time we detect a credit card bill every time we detect that you essentially get charged for it mm -hmm. we charge everyone else that agreed to, to split it with you on your behalf so seeing if that's something that people like as opposed to just a more vanilla recurring payment like oh select user paid three dollars every month is something that like we're we're gonna a b test nice 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 yeah yeah you're basically trying like different onboarding mechanisms and different ways for folks to split their subscription right what's more appealing to them any thoughts around like community building and, and helping friends connect to each other beyond payments. I say this because on Venmo, uh, you have this uh, this feature that annoys the hell out of me, which is like right. when you pay someone is public by default. Right. I think they do that to sort of like incentivize this, like, oh, I'm sharing that I'm paying my friends or I don't know. Yeah. Um, so interestingly enough, like a feature we want to roll out before the end of the year mm -hmm. is a discover feature so like to really hint at this oh we're gonna let you access more content through through splitting and um, essentially what we want to enable is for you to see uh what subscriptions your friends own and then be able to sort of request access to them so that for example i have friends that say they say like oh i really want to like buy bloomberg right or like the bloomberg newspaper but like i don't have like six other people that would bring down the cost from mm -hmm. four to, to, to five and so if you see that there's like a friend of yours that's already splitting like three others, you could like potentially join that tab and then gain access to this content and that you'd like before. So that's sort of like a social element that we're going to build. And hopefully that'll give us like some sort of, of moat uh, against like other people that, that try to build the same product as us. Nice, nice. And we're, we're going to continue to geek out on your idea for the folks who are interested in the other parts. <laughs> feel free to move forward, but I'm going to continue to hone in on this idea because it's very exciting. So how about what's your mode um, with regards to this? Netflix, you know, you're small. They don't care at the moment that, that you know, that you're splitting um, or other subscription services. How do you see them reacting to uh, high growth of this product? How do you foresee right. that? And, and how do you, how would, you know, how, how are you thinking about it? It's going to depend highly on, on a couple of things. It's going to depend, uh, one, on whether or not most of the users that use our app are previous non-users of Netflix. So people that uh, didn't own like a given subscription in the past, that are now purchasing it because they can split it with us. Or or if they're like uh, current users that choose to split with other current users, right? right? Because there are basically three cases. It's net new users. It's a uh, current users. Uh, that split with non-current users, so people that didn't have before, right. or two current users. And if that's the case, uh, where like the bottom line really does not improve for, for Netflix, right? That's that's sort of like one factor. Our hypothesis is, is, is that it's going to be the the former, like it's going to be like net new users. Right. Um, well, and then also, the you other, could also focus on that, right? By by design, that, you know, as a, as a way to protect yourself, potentially. Exactly, exactly. And then the other factor is going to be whether or not uh, most of like the new users joining um, are doing so, are, are say like roommates uh, that under their terms of service uh, can can do so, can, can, can like legally or yeah, yeah, like if they're roommates, then under under Netflix's terms of service, then they can uh, completely do this fine. Uh, oh, but if, if we see, if we see that that there are people that perhaps like don't uh, tend to like live in the, in the same location, then perhaps they might be more angry about it. So it. Um, on our terms of service, we say that we, we do not condone the violation of other services right. in the US. So, so hopefully that'll deter like mis potential misuse. Mis got, it, got it. 
Got it. Awesome. Uh, Victor, thank you so much for that. Uh, I love the fact that you've been so open about it and hopefully others can learn from your experience. And also we can connect in three to six months and see how things have turned out and, and just learn with you and this uh, journey that you, you've taken, brave journey that you've taken. Let's move on and talk about your time before the, you started this journey. Tell us about yourself, you know, what you've been up to leading up yeah. to the, the journey. Yeah, so I'm, yeah, I went to a high school in, in Caracas. I went to uh, the American International School there, ECA. I mean, I applied to a bunch of schools, considered maybe like going to the East Coast, got a couple cool offers, but ultimately decided to go to Stanford because I think that's the best college in the world. That's where it's <laughs> down. Confirmation I think bias. Other, it, it's unquestionably the best. And just because of like how entrepreneurial it is, I feel like I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now if i were going up like a school on the east coast or somewhere else yeah if you were in the east coast you would be freezing now exactly (laughs) i mean i'd be at home so maybe not like freezing freezing but like yeah i totally feel that got it got it and how was that journey from venezuela to stanford any right a part of the reason i was able to to do that is the fact that when i went to an international school uh, so that really like i mean helped like my ability to like read and write in english yeah for one um, and then two, it just got me in the mindset of like applying to, to American schools and getting ready for all this. So I did a lot of extracurricular activities. I had like other like quasi entrepreneurial projects that I did in high school and they were mostly non for profit, but, but they were entrepreneurial nonetheless. Can you please tell us about them? I'd love to learn like other things that you've done before this, um, mm-hmm. and how that informed what you're doing now. Right. So I guess I'll, I'll comment on a couple of projects. And one was a project that I actually worked on with, with, a, with a co-founder I'm working on right now. And back when I was a, a senior in high school, when there was, oh, that, I think that your viewers might find this like pretty interesting. And when they're there, I mean, there's still hyperinflation in Venezuela. I helped run my, the, the, the kiosk, the kiosk uh, at my school, at my school, right? So, wait, and, wait, wait. so at your school? You and my are, school had a, a canteen where we sold snacks um, after class, right? And basically what happened, we were such a small business that we couldn't even like afford a, a punto de venta. So like a, a place to a, a square credit card terminal. Yeah. Um, Point of and, and, and there was no cash. And and but, but, and it don't, at that point in time, Venezuela wasn't dollarized. So what happened? A, basically, we gave people like people like kids came after school. We gave them their items and then we wrote down their, their name on an Excel sheet. And we're like, OK, X person owes me a 10 bolivares or whatever. But what would happen is that we would then have to like text them and ask them to like wire transfer us. And so by the time they wired us, they wired us money was worthless. Money than the va- than the current value of the product they had consumed. The, and so of hyperinflation, yeah, right? Exactly. And so uh, what I built with with my friend uh, Kevin, that's the name, his co- my my co-founder, is is sort of like this, I guess, quasi like POS software where you you just had a, a your list of customers and your list of um, products and essentially every time someone someone purchased a product, you you didn't write down the amount of like money that you you didn't write down the amount of money they owed. You write wrote down like the the product they they bought so that every time you up- updated like your product's prices and it up- automatically like updated the balance of what everyone owed. And so in the end, like we could charge people uh, the present value of the goods they had purchased and not like the value of the the value of the day that they had purchased it. If that makes sense. I think that was a little bit of... No, no, no. I think it makes sense. Look, I'm going to try to like tell you what I heard is in Venezuela, there was hyperinflation, Mm. right? We were not... Venezuela was not dollarized when you were there. Not at all. You had to... You you were managing a canteen. You didn't have a point of sale. People Mm. didn't have cash and you had to figure out how to keep the accounting, right? Exactly. You were trying to solve like people need to eat and... But their currency it doesn't facilitate the transaction, right? I think it's mm-hmm. fascinating, Victor, that like your first thing, I don't know how old were you, 15 years old, 14, when you did that? Probably, probably like six, 16. 16 probably there 16. you go. It was a fintech enterprise, right? Um, and now you're also doing a fintech enterprise. Um, I mean, not not quite fintech because we didn't yeah. actually process the payments. It was just like a... You, but, but you were facilitating you were facilitating a transaction, right? Facilitating like the the, the accounting that's in right. the back end, yeah. Sure. That's right, that's right. Because I think the, the main question and when I move forward to being Venezuelan, right, is like how how did living in Venezuela prepare you for prepared you for this venture that you're starting? And I think you answered the question with that, right? If mm-hmm. you hadn't been faced with 
hyperinflation and that issue at school, you would not have gone through through the trouble of like solving that, right? Yeah, um, yeah I'm, exactly. Um, what else? Uh, so that, that's an amazing story. Um, uh, I'm sure other Venezuelan Americans listening are laughing right now of all the other crazy stuff they had to do living in, in, in Venezuela, right? Uh, right. But, but tell me something else. Uh, what else, like any other experience that you treasure from Venezuela that you think that you value uh, now that you're a sophomore at Stanford? I would say I'll just briefly talk about like one of the other projects I worked on while, when I was in high school uh, with these students and from like 13 other schools in, in Caracas. We started this organization called like the English Debate Association of Venezuela. The idea was that in Caracas, there's like a lot of talented um, MUN debaters and they all go compete in these competitions abroad and they all individually win uh, like trophies for their school. But there's sort of like no unified a Venezuelan delegation uh, that represents us abroad, kind of in a similar capacity to how there could be like an international math Olympiad right. a delegation, right? Mm -hmm. And so the idea was that we create like a national selection competition uh, where we'd invite like kids that we know are really good at debate to debate against each other. And so that then get like a delegation together to send them to this other competition called the World Schools Debating Competition. And so I think ultimately that taught me a lot about like um you know managing managing groups of people like working in the interest of like a larger goal learning how to like delegate tasks um on the frame of, of venezuela and like that they that was like the 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 micro objective was that like getting a delegation that's nationally representative of, of venezuela's ability to debate but the macro was like getting people to engage in speech in a country where like speech isn't regularly encouraged right so so yeah that's, that's awesome. like something else that, that i worked on in high school that i think kind of prepared me to to be working on what I'm working on right now. That's awesome, Victor. I love that. Uh, look, yeah, I think when you're a, when you're an entrepreneur, you're basically trying to solve issues that you see and problems that you see around you. Right. And it doesn't have to be money making. Right. It could be simply being an agent of change. Um, so I love those stories. And I love the fact that, um, you know, you're in I think you're in your third or fourth venture. I, I, I think that you're going to have many more uh, and I wish you the best um in in your current one okay uh victor so on the on our last on our last um uh on our last section we were talking about how being a venezuelan uh helped you in your in your current venture um and this is like very philosophical but i just want to uh, get your thoughts on like what are things that you treasure from being a venezuelan and and in terms of values And what are things that you um, have sort of changed and left behind? I'll tell you one to help you in your answer. Okay, I'll tell you one. Wait, can you just to clarify the, the latter part of the question. Sure, what do you sure. mean? Like, I want to answer the questions so that you see what I mean. So I value that we're scrappy. That because okay. we don't, you know, if something breaks, you can't just go to Amazon and get the part. Mm -hmm. And you know, if if the if the dryer breaks, you can't just like go to the store and get it because it's going to take like a month or two to get. So that, that means that we have to um, have folks that fix things that are scrappy and that are willing to do things differently. Right. I appreciate right. that a lot. Um, one thing that I don't appreciate is, uh, and that I've changed since I've been in the U S is uh, uh, being on time. Right. Mm. Uh, that I've sort of like put away and said, no, it's good to be on time. So right. and that's what I mean by the question. Like what are the things that you think like you appreciate Uh, and things that you don't necessarily appreciate from your experience in Caracas. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that the thing I value the most of having grown up in Venezuela is that I have a lot of perspective um, that, you know, I was born, I was born after like Chavez uh, came, mm -hmm. came into power. And so, you know, I saw like relatively like at a, at a young age, like the decline of, of, of the country, a pretty, pretty, pretty probably. And so I guess like just just coming from there makes me, I guess, like philosophically, a person that doesn't uh, tend to take things uh, for granted. I think it just made me like a very grateful uh, person in general. Um, so that's something that's something I really like and, and cherish from being Venezuelan. Um, and then on the latter point, I think something that that I don't appreciate and that I don't know if like other Venezuelans can, can agree with me on this is that culturally, Um, it's sort of, I don't know if it's encouraged, but it's kind of like acceptable to be 
a vivo or like be, be like like wise you know like it's like cool like oh game like i cut system. the line like, game the like, system to get like, ahead right I, I i made my way around this and it's like oh like I, i'm so cool so i think that that's something i don't necessarily like appreciate from there uh, culturally but ultimately i think that the good outweighs the bad and in, in some future hopefully like we'll all be recording this uh, <laughs> down there in, in caracas you know like starting a business over, over there trying to like re rebuild the country right that's awesome that's awesome i'm sure many people are applauding you right now listening to this because it's quite inspiring to see a 19 year old venezuelan just thinking how to go back so uh thank you for that lift of of hope uh cool all right Th uh, let's move on to uh our last piece let's talk about uh just uh in the next few minutes uh, advice so we have Uh, hopefully some entrepreneurs, uh, Venezuelan or not, uh, what advice would you give th to them with regards to starting their venture? Um, like three things that you would uh, ad advise. Your three tips yeah. from Victor. <laughs> well, I, first, I would take everything I say with, with a grain of salt, just because <laughs> I'm still like a 19-year-old kid and I'm, I'm, I'm playing around. Um, but I would say a piece of advice for... Uh, perhaps like entrepreneurs that are in college uh, specifically, I would um, think very carefully uh, before starting a business that has the possibility of being capital intensive. Mm. And because if it is, uh, you're probably going to go have to raise venture capital. And that usually implies um, you necessarily having to take a, either time off school or, or, or like dropping school completely. Um, And so that's definitely like a real, very real possibility uh, for me right now. Um, and so that's something I, I would just like caution anyone uh, before like, like starting the business. That's awesome. That's, so, that's great. Yeah, what, okay. Last two, last two. What's one thing that you're, uh, that you learned since you started or and so, uh, one thing you, you wish you knew before you got started? I guess, hmm. Uh, one thing I wish I knew is mm -hmm. something you know now that you didn't know six months ago that you wish you knew. I guess, okay, one thing is that a uh, uh, .edu email address is very, very useful. So I really like genuinely always underestimate the power of a, of a cold email like i used to very under underestimate that but now um i regularly like dm like people with like large followings on twitter or like send out emails and i usually get a response so even if you don't have a dot edu email address like something i've learned is cold, that so, so people, think, please please say more about cold emails and reaching out to folks on the interwebs especially twitter like vc twitter and startup twitter yeah like i discovered that i have this friend and uh, that he's like man you have to get on tech you have to get on vc twitter mm -hmm. um and i don't like there's been cases where i just like reach out to entrepreneurs that i know have had like similar problems to mine and i'm like hey i'm like having i'm have this like growth blockade is there any way you, you could like hop on a call and we could like chat about this and like you'd be surprised like more often than not people will will reply like one person i i, I called emailed was rahul vohra Um, he's like the founder of Superhuman, um, and I just asked him about like how he like implement. Like I, I'm a really big fan of like Superhuman. This email provider is like whole G referral Gmail waiting list crack. program. Gmail on crack. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Gmail oh, on Gmail. On, Gmail. Yep. on Red Bull. Um, and he replied, and we like you know like we we chat for a bit. So like ultimately, that's something I I think is super underrated. Like I think at this point I could probably like. I, I look, at least based on like the success rate like I've had, I could probably yeah. like hold email almost anyone I want, and, like fingers crossed they'll like yeah. re reply. But that, I think that's a great, great advice for others, right? That don't be afraid to uh, reach to folks that you'd be surprised who can help. I think that culturally in VC world, startup world, um, folks are very helpful and they would be willing to lend you a hand. And by the way, uh, Victor, It's it's there for a lot of these folks is all about deal flow, right? So mm -hmm. there there's a there's a shared interest in for them learning what you're up to, mm -hmm. um, and sort of seeing what's next, seeing what the next generation of builders are building for their own generation, which is what you're doing. You're 
a 19 year old building for other 19 year 19 year old kids right and so for them it's also a learning experience as to okay what are these kids up to so so i think that the, i think that your your lesson is share and seek advice because other because folks out there are willing to to give to you what i would t say back at you victor is that you're also teaching them right uh, mm -hmm. your experience as a as a um you know as a sophomore at stanford also informs them of what's next so all right um let's see three predictions for 2030 uh, three predictions uh, for 2030 um i think vr will play a huge a uh, role in the way we we communicate with other people uh, like i don't know if like facebook or like current uh, forms of social media but there will be like some form of social media that goes completely into like uh, virtual reality um two um i think that fingers crossed we're, we're gonna have had a government change in venezuela and a lot of people listening to this right now are gonna be back at home you know yes. working on it happen um and then a uh, third prediction is that uh hmm Will re is, is remote work here to stay? Do you think your generation will go out and all have remote jobs or you'll, you'll think your generation will go back to the office? I think my generation will uh, basically demand employers to offer remote work. I feel like so many people are very accustomed to say watching lectures online, working async now, that going to like a fully uh, in-person, a uh, sort of like work environment that requires you to commute is something a lot of people aren't going to be receptive of. But I think ultimately some people are going to want it. Some people are not going to want it. And so like, there's just going to be an expectation that, that you offer it. Got it. Got it. So, um, since I asked the question, I'm sure that a lot of folks that, uh, would be interested to learn, tell us a bit about going remote while being at Stanford and how, how that has affected both, you know, the, the college and, and your guys's ability to receive value from, from mm -hmm. the university. Well, I think it really sucked. Like, I'm just gonna say very bluntly, like I'm not, I'm not a fan at all. I've, this is my second quarter I'm doing remotely. And I think in large part, I started, I started working on this company because I was so tired of doing school. I wasn't really enjoying it. That I said, you know what, I'm just gonna devote my time to other stuff that, that I enjoy and like I get more stuff out of. And I think ultimately, like next quarter, I'm, I'm gonna drop it. I'm not gonna do school um, because because I'm not because I'm not a fan of, of online. And so hopefully, I'll be back. A, you know, maybe next fall, maybe like a couple years after that, but when everything sort of like is back to normal um, and I don't have to go on Zoom and to like look at classes async. I will say though, uh, perhaps this might be interesting to viewers. It's kind of like a slight flex, I would say. Uh, the one class I have really enjoyed uh, remotely is this seminar uh, taught by Steve Ballmer. Um, at Stanford, so it's him and like 20 other kids. Who is in Steve Ballmer? Steve Ballmer, he ex CEO of Microsoft, a uh, probably like one of the 10 richest guys in the world, uh, Microsoft's largest uh, shareholder. Um, and the class is all about government, the U.S. government, how it spends its money, how it collects money. And so, I don't know. It's just been it's just been wow. a blast because he's brutal. He's he's very unlike other professors that today are very like handholdy. They're like, oh, like. We can like postpone the deadline, whatever. He's like, if he doesn't like what you say, he'll be like, that does not make sense. Or like, he's just very hard Close grader, which I appreciate. I, I really like that harshness because I think that that's what like startups and like the real world is is like. That's awesome. Like, that's very interesting. A billionaire tech, because he's founder of Microsoft, right? With with no, no, he's not a founder. He was actually like the first a uh, non-founder billionaire uh, oh, in the cool. United States. But but anyways, a tech a tech person who's a billionaire. Uh, teaching, who's basically teaching policy, right? Uh, or is it, yeah. ta well, th that is very interesting. I'm sure it's one thing that he was like, I'm going to get into this and like find out how it works. And then he learned about it and like, I'm going to teach it people how the government works. Right? Yeah, <laughs> it's good. He has this a nonprofit now called USA Facts that oh. basically does exactly that. And so I guess this is his way of like engaging with, with the work he's he does now. He owns the Clippers now as well, the LA Clippers, a basketball NBA team. Nice, nice. Well, Victor, thank you so much for your time. I can tell you that after this 30 minutes, I feel inspired um, and hopeful that, you know, the Venezuela, the young Venezuelan diaspora um, is powerful and you're a, uh, a great example of it. So 
thank you so much for your time and I'll let you say goodbye to our audience. Yeah, no, thank you everyone for listening and thank you for having, thank you for like staying in touch with me and like responding to my WhatsApps, given that I was just like a random kid you met when I was interviewing for MIT. And thanks everyone for listening. Totally. And if you're a Venezuelan entrepreneur um, and have enjoyed this, please reach out to us. If you would like to be interviewed, we'd be more than happy to have you. And if you've enjoyed it, please uh, give us some feedback, let us know and click on the places that you should be clicking. Um, and thanks for listening. Bye. Ciao.